All right, welcome everyone to my 16.4 B video uh, on Green's theorem. So this is our second day for Green's theorem. And in this video, we're gonna be starting to develop the flux version of Green's theorem. So that's kind of our main goal along the way in order to really discuss the flux version of Green's theorem. I need to tell you a little bit uh, about, well, flux integrals and kind of normal curves to, uh, you know, our, our classic parameterized curves back from chapter 13 sort of deal. So that's what we're gonna be discussing in this video. Uh, to start off, uh, how do we calculate out a normal vector to a 2D curve? So again, we have some two-dimensional curve, Xs and Ys. And you may recall right from 13.2 that uh, so long as you know derivatives exist, aka R is differentiable, then we're going to have a tangent vector given by R prime of T. So that was one of the main uses for the derivative. And of course, if this is a two-dimensional setup, then this is going to be the derivative of our X component and the derivative of our y component. And so that's how we calculate out the tangent vector. If we are then interested in a normal vector, remember the normal vector and the tangent vector should be perpendicular to one another. That is when you take the dot product of them, you should get out zero. And so the normal vector can be given by plus or minus and the big thing that we're going to do here is we're going to switch the order. So that is, I'm going to do y prime of t here and x prime of t. And I'm going to make one of these negative. So I'm going to go ahead and just write this for the time being with the negative x prime of t here. And so let's go ahead and double check. If we go ahead and we take our tangent vector, r prime of t, and we dot product this with our normal vector, which by the way, it does depend on T as well. So you could use N of T here. Let's see what we get. And ideally, right, this is gonna be zero uh, to get perpendicular or orthogonal vectors here. So again, R prime of T is X prime of T, Y prime of T. And we're gonna be dot product this with plus or minus. Um, and this is our Y prime of T comma negative X prime of T. So when we take this dot product, uh, I'm going to just move the plus and minus out here. So we're going to have x prime of t, y prime of t. That's after we multiply these first components together. And then the second components are going to be, oh, it looks like we have one negative here. So this is going to be negative y prime of t, x prime of t. And of course, Multiplication is commutative, so you can go ahead and switch the order as you'd like. And the big thing here is that these will nicely cancel out and we'll have plus or minus zero. All right, so you can see that we will have two normal vectors, kind of very similar to how you have two tangent vectors. So if I have a quick curve, and again, we'll just kind of show what we're getting out of all of this. And let's suppose we're at a particular point here. We have, of course, a couple of tangent vectors that are gonna be going through this curve at this point. And likewise, you're gonna have a couple of normal vectors. So you could have a normal vector that's pointing in this case, kind of up and left, or you have a normal vector that's kind of pointing down and to the right here. So these would be the kind of the two normal vectors. And that's why the plus and minus exists here uh, because right, you can, you can flip this. And of course it'll still be at this normal to the curve uh, sort of deal. So either this way or this way. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and practice with some specifics here. I have a vector function given to us over the interval from zero to two. And I'd like to find an equation of the normal vector that points to the right. So we're gonna go ahead and use our formula. First, we can take um, you know, the tangent vector. And so I'm gonna take derivatives here and I'm gonna have one and I'm gonna have negative two T. So that means, according to our formula up above, that our normal vector, and again, if you'd like to, it does depend on t, so you can say n of t here, is going to be plus or minus, and we're going to flip these. And according to our formula up here, right, we made the x1 negative. So we're going to go ahead and do that. So negative 1, we flip them, and we make one of them negative. Uh, in this case, it was in the second component that went along with this x prime of t. Okay, so we want the equation that points right to the right. So the normal vector for R that points to the right. Okay, so pointing to the right kind of comes down to this 
first coordinate right here, right? This negative 2t. And ideally, if the vector is pointing to the right, then that means that the, that coordinate there, our first coordinate should be positive. So pointing to the right, that just means that we need a positive. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and say x coordinate. And likewise, you could imagine uh, a question where it asks for the normal vector to point to the left, or you could ask for a normal vector that points upwards or downwards. Uh, later on, when we have closed curves, we'll be talking about like inward pointing normal vectors and outward pointing normal vectors. And so it's going to specify uh, kind of where this normal vector should be pointing. So that way we all kind of get a nice unique answer. And so if we go ahead and we plug in values, right, t ranging from zero to two, into our x coordinate here. So if I plug in 0, you know, 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.52, you'll notice that all of these, right? So for instance, if I just do t is equal to 1, right? I'm going to have negative 2 times 1 is going to be negative 2. So I have a negative x coordinate, which means that this is pointing off to the left, right? But literally, if I was to go ahead and sketch this, I go left 2 and down 1. So our normal vector would look something like this left two and down one at a particular time value. So this right here, if I leave it, AKA if I choose the plus option, then I'm pointing to the left. So in order to get this to point to the right, I'm gonna go ahead and choose this to include this extra negative sign here. And now when I apply this, I'm going to have two T and positive one. And now you can check if you go ahead and you plug in different t values ranging from zero to two up here, they will all point to the right, right? They'll have a positive x coordinate here. So this right here is our final answer, a normal vector for the curve. And of course it's changing as the curve is moving around, kind of you see this picture here, it doesn't right, uh, always stay pointed in exactly this direction, right? Later on perhaps, uh, right? It kind of looks a little bit different. Maybe here's the normal vector something like that. Um, but so yeah, it does change with t. But this right here is the normal vector that will always be pointing to the right on that interval there. All right. Well, with that, let's go ahead and move on. And I want to tell you a little bit about this thing, flux. So the flux of some vector field f across a curve c is given by and this is very similar to the work equation. So we'll have this integral of f dot something ds. Remember when we were doing work, it was f dot t. We were kind of adding up uh, kind of how much this vector field was going along in the same uh, direction as the curve. But when you're talking about flux, you do f dot n. So this is where we need that normal vector here. Uh, and in particular, Right, n will be a um, unit normal vector. I guess I should have specified here a, a unit normal vector, and things will cancel out very nicely uh, with this ds, uh, kind of similar to when we did f dot t. Uh, so let me just go ahead and say where n is a unit normal vector here. Okay, so with that, we can get another version of Green's theorem that will help us calculate out flux whenever we have a positively oriented uh, simple closed curve. So, right, Green's theorem was used in our, uh, you know, yesterday or, you know, the, the first day of Green's theorem was used to calculate out work or when we had our classic kind of line integrals of f dot d, uh, ds. In this case, we're going to be able to calculate out flux using Green's theorem. So we have the very similar setup, right? We need a positively oriented curve. We need piecewise smooth. It needs to be a nice closed curve that doesn't self-intersect, so it's simple. Um, we have our vector field, two-dimensional two vector field here. And we're going to be calcul calculating out this flux, right? Which means that we're switching these P's and Q's and we're making one of them negative. So if you go ahead and you write down this F dot N D S, and kind of write it in this other form with the p's and the q's, it looks like this line integral with p dy minus q dx. Right, so things are kind of swapped around here. And this is going to be equal to, and again, Green's theorem turns line integrals into double integrals. So this is going to be the double integral 
over the region D, which is inside of C, the boundary curve there. And in this case, we're going to take the partial derivative of P with respect to X and the partial derivative of Q with respect to Y. So it works out quite nice in this case. In fact, you may uh, look at this and say, uh, we've seen something quite similar to this. This is going to be equal to the divergence of F, right? So this is a two-dimensional divergence here. Uh, but again, you're taking that first component, P, and taking the derivative with respect to X, and that second component, Q, and you're taking the derivative with respect to Y and summing them all together here. So this will be a divergence uh, of our vector field here, which is quite nice. Um, of course, equivalently, uh, you could write this, uh, I guess I already did, uh, but what I had planned on doing here was this f dot n ds down here is equal to, and again, this double integral, and I guess I'll use the other notation uh, just so that you get familiar with it, right? The partial notation. So the partial of P with respect to X and the partial of Q with respect to Y. And again, N should be an outward uh, pointing normal vector. So this is kind of what it means to have positive orientation here. So we again want outward pointing. And uh, I'll say, again, to be specific here, uh, unit normal vector. So an outward pointing unit normal vector. Okay, the proof of this, uh, as you may recall from our last pre-class video in 16.4a, right, the video, uh, the proof for Green's theorem is fairly complicated. You have to break it up into lots of little pieces, but there's actually a trick. Once you have one of the forms of Green's theorem proven, you can quickly prove the other one by just doing this clever rewriting of G. So if you just kind of set this up and do the exact same proof, but instead of your vector field being PQ, if you just let your vector field be negative QP and apply that Green's theorem from last time, uh, you get the same result. And so that's quite wonderful. The last thing I'd like to do in this video is to practice, right? I'd like to calculate out the outward flux for this vector field right here across the curve, which is the unit circle, x squared plus y squared equals one. So outward flux, again, is this f dot n ds across the curve. We just found out, thanks to the Green's theorem formula up here, that if you're interested in calculating this out for a nice closed curve like we have here, this would be the same thing as taking the double integral over this region. Oh, hi, Swashi. And that region is going to be inside of this curve, right? So inside this unit circle. Um, and so, right, instead of talking about the circle itself, we're talking about the circle and its interior. So that right there is going to be our D. And the thing that we're going to be integrating is the divergence of F. So I need to take some partial derivatives. So looking at the first component here, I need to take the partial derivative with respect to X. And then for the second component, I need to take the derivative with respect to Y. So this is gonna be one plus X DA. And now we have a double integral. So we kind of go back and think if that, this was a, uh, chapter 15 problem, how would I evaluate out this double integral? And you notice that, well, we are integrating over a circle. And so hopefully um, you'd say, well, circles work very nicely in polar coordinates. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to polar coordinates. One plus R cosine theta. And instead of DA, I'm going to write DR, R, DR, D theta. And this is the unit circle. So it's, it has a radius of one here. So my radiuses are gonna range from zero to one to get the interior of that circle. And our theta is gonna range from zero to two pi. So we're gonna have a setup that looks like this. Now let's go ahead and evaluate. Um, let's see, I'll take one line to simplify here. So this is gonna be R plus R squared cosine theta dr d theta. Now we need to integrate this with respect to R. So that is, uh, I'm going to have, let's see, one half R squared plus one third R cubed. And that stuff with cosines along for the ride. Need to evaluate this from zero to one. So of course, when you plug in zero for R, you're gonna get out zero. When you plug in one for R, you're just gonna get ones here, right? One squared and one cubed. And so this very nicely simplifies down to one half plus one third cosine theta. And I still need to integrate with respect to theta. So when I integrate this with respect to theta, I'm gonna have one half theta 
plus one third sine of theta. And I need to evaluate this from zero to two pi. Now, sine is quite nice. If you plug in zero and if you plug in two pi, it gives you out zero for both of those. So what we're gonna end up having here is just one half times two pi minus zero. And so our overall answer here is going to be pi. So we have an answer of pi. And just to kind of give you some idea of what you're actually calculating out when you calculate out the flux, uh, the answer pi means that more stuff is leaving, right? You have kind of this outward flux, more stuff is leaving this area than is coming in. So it's kind of very closely tied with divergence. And that's kind of why I brought this up here. Divergence is kind of how much stuff is entering or exiting a particular point, right? And so here we are adding up the divergence over all of these points. And so you get the divergence essentially over this entire region. And so if you were to graph our vector field that we had here and look at our curve, you would identify, hey, a lot more stuff's leaving this than it is coming in. And in fact, I have ready for us what exactly that picture looks like. So let me go ahead and switch over here and show you what that looks like. All right, here it is in the Monroe 3D Calc Plotter. I have our unit circle, uh, which I had to parametrize, uh, cosine and sine there. And then I have our vector field over here on the left, this x plus three in our first coordinate. And in our second coordinate, I have this x, y minus five. Oh, excuse me. And so you can see what, it, <coughs> geez, you can see what it looks like here. We of course do have some vectors, right? That are kind of, uh, oops, I guess I shouldn't have touched this. Um, Oh, this is kind of showing me my, uh, oh, some flow lines. But we do have some uh, vectors that are going into the circle, right? And so that's where you would have uh, negative divergence, right? Uh, and But you have much more vectors and kind of longer vectors exiting the circle. And so that's why overall you have a positive divergence or a positive flux over this entire curve. So again, uh, flux is used to show how much is entering or exiting some region. Um, and so in this case, the flux is positive, And so more is exiting than is coming in. All right. Well, that'll do it for me today. I hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see you in class. Take care.